Today in the lab we're working on the Quadra 950 again. Last time we got it all disassembled and this time we're going to put it all back together. Okay, so I've got the case all cleaned up. I didn't wash it off because, you know, it's it'd be difficult to dry and it's a great big thing. But I did wipe out all the cobwebs. So now I'm going to put uh, the foot back on using just some super glue. And there we have the foot now replaced, so both of them are on there. You can hardly tell with the super glue because it was a nice clean break. While well, I got the super glue out, I'm also going to try and replace this, this other piece. But uh, unfortunately the break is not so clean, so it might be a bit tricky. Well, I tried on this one, but it was a bit tricky, so I'm going to give up for now. Maybe come back to this. Now I've let that plastic piece hard dry into place, I've lowered in the motherboard, and there's all these guide pieces that stick up from the case that uh, position the motherboard very well. And then to secure it in place, I just push it in from this back side, uh, and there's a little tab here that'll lock it into place. This tab right here. So I've got the the fan cleaned out here with some canned air and a, a damp cloth and looking pretty clean now. And when I, when I blitz these with canned air I always hold them stationary because it's not good for the fan and also if the fan is spinning it can induce a current on, uh, on the line. So um, you know, whenever you clean these out make sure that you're not causing them to spin. I've got my blue SCSI mounted in here after taking out the old, uh, the old disk drives. Now, this system was designed to have several disk drives on it, and I've got two, two trays here. And they're supposed to kind of slide together. So what I've found is these uh, little tabs here, which are supposed to make it so that you can kind of slide these together. Um, they're a little bent so it doesn't slide together easily. Um, I kind of have to force it a little bit. Um, but I'm leaving both of these trays in here even though one of these is going to be empty just because I don't have another place to put it and might as well keep it all together. Um, I'll put the rest of the screws in a little bag and, um, and tape them to here so that you know if I ever put other uh, drives in here or something like that, they'll be, they'll be here and available. One of these drives has left some black sticky goop on this cage. Never seen that before from a drive, and I'm not sure if it's from the drive or if maybe it was applied when this was installed. I don't know, but I'm going to have to clean this up with either some goo gone or something else. And with a bit of goo gone, you know, this is all now, pretty good, not so sticky anymore, and uh, this stuff really does work pretty well cleaning up uh, sticky plastics that have uh, degraded. Now that the fan is clean, we'll hook that back up. It has a nice removable connector, and we'll get the grate back on top of it. These fans are directional, so I made sure to put it back in the same way that it was in before. Before we put the power supply back in, we put in a fresh battery. And the battery card holder. Next we want to replace the key. The uh, And the interrupt and the reset button. 
Now with that done, we can put in the power supply and notice how there's kind of a cutout for the metal part of the power supply so it fits in there just so. So before I get everything screwed back together, you know, I want to make sure it works and, uh, you know, still does. was able to get Mac OS uh, 7.5 installed successfully. Although I had a few issues with uh, some incorrect SCSI ID settings. So I've got this machine booted up uh, from a network startup disk and have mounted a volume with some applications on, uh, on the PowerBook. And I find that Mac OS's, um, you know, built-in SCSI debugging tools are not great. So there's uh, this SCSI probe program from back in the day that just gives you information about what devices are on your SCSI bus. And we can see this uh, Sony tape drive that I have is at drive ID 1. Now if I look at the drive itself, this selector on the side says 2, so that's not the right drive ID. And if we look here on the back, it might be a little hard to see, but the two leads for the SCSI termination, one of them's not quite aligned with the other. So this is getting the wrong SCSI ID because these are out of alignment. And that caused problems when I was trying to boot and install to my blue SCSI here. I have virtual drives defined on that with SCSI ID 0 and 1 and this was supposed to be 2 but because of the way that was cabled it was showing up as 1 and so the system would just hang when I tried to boot it as it couldn't resolve that SCSI ID conflict. Now there are three screws that hold this in. There's two up here and then one down here. So I've gone ahead and wired all the drives because um, I think this will make the final assembly easier. And these cages like this have little hooks on them. So they just hook in to a bottom plate and then I think I can slide this entire bottom plate on top of the power supply. These screws right here hold these drive cages onto this bottom plate <clears throat> and like I say should be able to take this and it mates with the top part of the power supply. Yep, so this mates with the bottom part of the power supply and you can push it back and forward. Um, I guess you would push it back to remove it and then push it forward so that the front parts uh, of the front accessible drives line up with the case. And then once you have this kind of lined in, there's a screw here and then one further down the case over there uh, that you screw in and then it's all secure. I'm going to connect our two power leads here. as well as the lead down to the motherboard. Floppy drive and the SCSI cable. Alright, so there we have it all cabled up. 
Not quite exactly like it was originally, but I think it's all right. I think this will do fine. Getting close. Need to uh, now connect the external speaker. Now I could have taken this off of this front panel, but I decided not to since I wasn't cleaning the front panel. But it just has a single lead that's uh, kind of hard to see here on the motherboard, but it's right down here next to the RAM slot. So we'll get that connected and uh, then boot this thing up and see what happens. So I have this uh, System 7 network access disk that I'm going to try and boot from, and then I'll pull the operating system bits over the network and get them installed. All right, and the system seems to be booting all right. To get the bottom panel on, we just kind of line it up and snap it right back on. Although now I realize that uh, these should have gone on first. So I have to take this back off again and then put the uh, drive plates on first. So floppy drive goes on first. It just snaps in there. And then the bottom cover goes on next. And then finally, now we can actually attach the bottom piece. So one issue that I did encounter was after I got this put back together, it would always boot no matter what floppy disk I put in with, uh, with this error. <laughs> Not very descriptive, just a floppy disk with an X on it. And uh, what would happen, if I go over here, is it, this disk I know is good because I can boot it on my other Mac. If I pop it in, it'll try and read it and then immediately eject it. And it would do this over and over again couldn't get it to boot. This happens because I had the battery out for too long. Now the clock battery, not only does it keep the clock, but it also keeps PRAM active. So that's a little bit of RAM that's battery backed up that keeps certain settings. And that's one of those is the boot setting. And so if you keep the battery out too long, it forgets where it boots from. And you get this uh, disc with an X on it. To fix this, we need to hold down the Command Option R and P keys during boot up. So I hit the power button on the keyboard and hold these down after the chime and then release them. We should be able to get a good boot now. And there we go, we got a happy Mac. And now it's starting to boot. Not very useful diagnostic on the boot up for this. <laughs> but that's how I fix that. Got this other piece glued back on. Not as good of a job as the other foot. I couldn't get it quite to line up correctly. But at least it's on there. And maybe someone in the future will fix it better than I could. So now the Quadra 950 is all back together and it's got a blue SCSI hard drive. The broken plastic pieces have been super glued back into place and we got an OS installed. The only thing that I haven't tested out yet but I left it in is the tape drive. The tape drive probably has some bands that have rotted. We shall see. I have tapes for this but 
But right now I don't have a faceplate for it, so rather than leave that empty and ugly, leave the tape drive in. Now there's just one more item before I can really get to using this thing. Now if we look on the back here, there doesn't appear to be an Ethernet jack. Or at least if you don't know what Ethernet used to look like, you might be forgiven for assuming that this machine does not have Ethernet. This port right here is an Ethernet port. Now, it doesn't look like a normal Ethernet port because Apple, at least until much later in the beige line, used a proprietary Ethernet port that they called AAUI, or Apple AUI. So before the late 90s, and really probably before 100 base T became pretty standard, um, it was very common for Ethernet cards to have what were called AUI ports. And uh, these ports look like this. And um, you would plug in an adapter. This is an AUI to uh, RJ45 or 10 base T adapter. And so rather than have every possible cabling standard, they would just have an AUI port. And then you buy one of these to, uh, to connect the Ethernet card to whatever cabling standard you have. Now eventually they would start to produce cards with AUI and 10 base 2 connectors. And then eventually some cards had AUI, 10 base T, and 10 base 2 connectors. It was a big transitional period until the industry settled on the RJ45 jack and that's what we know today mostly. Now Max used a special variant of this port but it was the same port it just had a unique connector and uh, so I got this new old stock AAUI to 10 base T adapter. I bought this new old stock instead of trying to find a used Apple one because uh, this cable here tended to break a lot. I've got at least when I used to have more Macs before I got rid of them all um, I had a couple of these that were broken or like not functional so I figured a new one since they're still available and not too expensive would be better here. So this just plugs right into the AAUI jack and snaps right in and then on this end you'd connect your RJ45 and have network access. So we've now got this Quadra all back together and better than ever we fixed the issue with the power supply fan, and it's actually nice and quiet now. We put a blue SCSI hard drive in there to replace the aging spinning disk hard drives. We cleaned up the case, super glued back in some of the broken components, and now have it connected up to Ethernet. And if I turn on the monitor here, we can see this machine is running Netscape Communicator 4 which is a real blast from the past for me. That used to be my primary web browser. And we even got networking working. It's loaded up the Google homepage here. We can see the, the classic Netscape logo there. So thank you all for watching and look forward to future episodes where we use this Quadra to do some more local talk experiments, maybe some interoperability things with the Amigas and other systems I have, and maybe some old Mac 68K stuff. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time.